C.S. Lewis is one of the most popular Christian apologists of the 20th century. His writings present spiritual truths in easy-to-understand terms that appeal to a diverse cross-section of readers. But what can this famed writer who captured the imagination of millions with his adventures to Narnia teach us about life, love, and loss? C.S. Lewis imagined himself as a lifelong bachelor. As a professor at Oxford, he enjoyed the company of fellow scholars and writers. Lewis engaged in debate with the liveliest minds of his day and seemed quite content with his solitary life. Everything changed, however, after Lewis began a correspondence with an American writer named Joy Davidman Gresham. At first, Lewis arranged a civil union between himself and Joy so that his new friend and her sons could remain in England. But when Joy was diagnosed with bone cancer shortly after their marriage, the couple realized the depth of their love for each other. Thus began an intense three-year journey of exhilarating happiness and heart-wrenching pain, ending with Joy's early death at age 45. No one ever told me that grief felt so like fear, Lewis wrote of his experience. He came to terms with the loss of his wife in a series of journal entries that became the basis for his reflective book, A Grief Observed. In this work, readers encounter and identify with the emotions often felt after a significant loss as Lewis chronicles his grief in a sparse, moving prose. The book was first released under a pseudonym. Eventually, it was released in Lewis's name after his death. Well, there's a common misconception that Lewis had led a charmed life up until the time that Joy died, and that this was the first time he'd really had to deal with these emotions of bereavement and loss. Actually, there's a kind of symmetry. He lost someone important to him in every uh, decade of his life. He lost his mother when he was nine years old. He lost a, a, a number of his comrades during World War I. Of the five people he trained with at Oxford, the other four were all killed in. And it's almost a touchstone of a spiritual condition how he responded to these different losses. By the time Joy passed away, when Lewis uh, was, uh, had been married in 1957 and then she died in 1960, this was actually his fourth or fifth experience of bereavement. So he really was acquainted with grief before he wrote Grief Observed. Joy died in July of uh, 1960, and Lewis began keeping a journal about his feelings and all the turmoil and tumult that he was feeling. Uh, it was partly autobiographical, and it was partly meant to be a universal experience of any grieving husband. A Grief Observed has provided many readers with inspiration and healing when grieving the loss of a loved one. However, Lewis's work is more than a reflection of the pain associated with death. It is a primer for sorting through the feelings that accompany any significant loss. My mother loved to laugh. Um, she had a good sense of humor. Um, I remember staying, staying up nights with her watching Johnny Carson. And uh, so much so that sometimes my dad would come out and say, why don't you two go to bed? Um, I remember her laughter and I missed that. My mother was uh, a mother of ten, and so I, um, I think of her as the consummate mother to have had that many children, and uh, it's one of the things I miss about her was having her, when I became a mother, to talk to me about mothering. I got a call in the middle of the night, um, December 17th, 1985, from my 17-year-old sister 
telling me that my mother had been murdered. My mother had been babysitting two small children, uh, actually a friend of my sister's, older sister's. And the, uh, the father of the family owned a garage and had a, an employee he had fired. And this disgruntled employee showed up at the house where my mother was babysitting, high on drugs, and uh, got in somehow. We don't know how, if my mother let him in or knowing that he was a friend of the family, of supposedly an employee, or whether he forced his way in. But he, he got her to the second floor and he shot her and stabbed her to death. And then he robbed the home. They found out who had done it pretty quickly and uh, he was brought to trial, which was excruciating. We all attended and uh, just sat nervously waiting to hear what was gonna happen to him. And he was sentenced to life in prison and uh, that's where he is today and he has no option of parole. I think what I initially felt was horror. There just was no other word for it. Um, it was just unbelievable that this could really be happening. In discussing loss, we recognize that no two people grieve in the same way, and that the level of grief experienced is usually in proportion to the magnitude of the loss. In situations such as Lewis's, where a loss is anticipated, such as when facing a life-limiting illness or divorce, the grieving process begins prior to the actual loss itself. Jamie loved life. Uh, she was a very enthusiastic young lady. She enjoyed music, singing in the choir, and um, she loved her animals. She had three dogs and she just truly enjoyed being with them. In fall of 2008, our daughter Jamie was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. When we first uh, knew of Jamie's diagnosis, uh, the internet was kind of a mixed blessing. Uh, you could go to the internet and find out a great deal about stage four lung cancer and none of it was good. There was some hope during the process. Certainly after the initial rounds of chemotherapy, there was some indication that there was an improvement at least in stopping the spread of the cancer, but uh, that was rapidly uh, crushed when the MRIs came back and showed that although the chemo had stopped the growth of the cancer in the soft tissues, the, uh, it had accelerated even in the bony structures. And radiation could help the, the cancer in the bony structures and chemo in the soft tissues, but you couldn't do them both at the same time. So I think we realized that all we were doing to an extent was was delaying the uh, inevitable, if you will. We were able to go on a special trip to Scotland. This was uh, sponsored by the Make-A-Wish uh, Foundation. And um, we, our whole family went. This was a, a, a wish that Jamie had. We, um, eight of us went. Um, and this was one that we could cherish as a family together. Uh, for many, many, many years. And I think it has made our time of grief that much easier to cope with. Um, she um, just enjoyed this trip. Uh, it was shortly after returning from that trip that she um, suddenly died uh, with complications from her cancer. When I first realized that the loss was, was real, I think the most feeling was of sadness, of emptiness of regret that a life had come to end before its time. I don't believe that the grieving has interfered with my memories of Jamie. I always remember her as a vibrant young lady who brought much joy to my life, and I was blessed to have her. Uh, her last words helped in that, because instead of thinking of herself, she was telling us to tell other people she loved them. She told us to be strong, and she told us to keep our faith. And uh, that's much stronger than any loss of memory that I could have envisioned. Grief is an individual response to loss. Some will only experience a few of the feelings associated with grief, while others will work through a variety of emotions. Denial, anger, bargaining, guilt, and at some point, acceptance. 
The first emotion often felt is denial, in which we put aside the reality of loss and exist in a state of disbelief. A person in denial may ask, why is this happening to me? Or feel numb to emotional or spiritual pain. This is a natural reaction that protects us from being overwhelmed by the full impact and devastation of a significant loss. And I remember those first days just sort of moving through things like a robot, really just things that would be so overwhelming and disturbing, like going to the police station with my husband to identify my mother's pocketbook and just feeling nothing. And uh, going with my older brother to the funeral home to pick out a coffin and just feeling nothing. It was just numbness. For Lewis, part of his questioning and denial dealt with why God would allow a perfectly happy single person such as himself to find love and to come out of his shell, only to have that love stripped away through death. I met Tracy in the late 80s, and I can still remember the first time she came to church, and she sang music, and that got my attention. Uh, she had a great gospel voice, a big voice for her, and it wasn't long, about a year later, that we married. It was about six months before Christmas Eve of 94 that we found out we were expecting, and it was a girl, even had a name, Gabriella. It was Christmas Eve, about one in the morning, that I was awakened with Tracy let out a, like a moan and I just shot up out of bed. I knew something was wrong and began to find out from her what was wrong and uh, eventually was CPR because I knew she couldn't breathe. I knew she had asthma. I didn't know what was going on exactly. It was an asthmatic attack that she was having. I tried to save her for two or three hours they worked on her, but they couldn't save her or the baby. It was just too late. That's when it just all gushed out, just the tears and the feelings and the emotions. It was, it was over. And the fear was tough. And the feelings were so intense at that time. Um, yeah, that was 10 years ago, 15 years ago now. And I can still feel it when I talk about it. In the early days of grief, we first encounter the reactions of others to our loss. We find that there are those who avoid us as we grieve because they don't know what to say or do. Others attempt to bring us comfort, but their misplaced words add pain to the grieving process. Kind people have said to me, she is with God, Lewis wrote after his wife's death. In one sense, that is most certain. You tell me, she goes on, but my heart and body are crying out, come back, come back. Don't come talking to me about the consolations of religion, or I shall suspect that you don't understand. You have to watch what Lewis was talking about, the consolations of religion, where you just use pat answers, that the cure-alls, I would call it. I was working in a university counseling center. And when I shared with my colleagues that my mother had been murdered, one of them said to me, think how great a therapist you will be having gone through this. And I was dumbfounded. I, I didn't say anything to her. I just remember s sitting there and thinking to myself, I'd much rather be a worse therapist and have my mother back. I think the best way that, uh, and the best consolation is simply to be there and to help them with those little things that they have to do while they're grieving. You can't give consolation. You can't give that hope. You can't tell it to a person. They have to discover it. They have to discover those consolations themselves and experience that hope personally. Through the fog of grief, we may realize that many people are uncomfortable around a grieving person 
as it reminds them that loss can touch their lives too. Lewis acknowledged this difficulty when he mused that the bereaved should be set apart, just as lepers are, to heal within a more secluded community. I certainly tried not to withdraw from the world, but there was a little of that involved in it. I was blessed to have very supportive friends and family that helped me, but there were always those awkward moments, especially when other people would come up and not know what to say. So to that extent, I think there was some withdrawal. I met the lead singer songwriter of Brainiac, Tim Taylor, at a nightclub uh, with bass player Juan Monasterio, and it was arranged for me to try out as the drummer for the band. And uh, within a year, we'd already put out a seven-inch single and had started touring extensively. Uh, we would later tour the continental United States several times and Europe a couple times. Uh, we put out three full-length albums and uh, two EPs, a couple little uh, oddball singles here and there. Tim was uh, an amazing person. He was larger than life, uh, both on stage and off. Uh, we became very close, more or less lived together in a van or at practice for five solid years. And it was uh, actually on May 23rd, 1997 that Tim's roommate and friend Dave Doman uh, called me over to the house to tell me that Tim had been killed in a car accident. I got in my car, more or less emotionless, just blank, and started driving home when I happened to pass the scene of the accident and saw the telephone pole that he struck. So I pulled into the, to the gas station right there and. I got on the payphone, I called my dad first thing and uh, just started screaming, just crying, screaming, just full of despair, full of panic, disbelief, I uh, didn't know what to do. After the initial shock of learning that Tim was dead it had really, really set in, it then all of a sudden dawned on me that five years of hard work and travel and tour and uh, Brainiac getting to the place it was at the time was all of a sudden over. And we were actually just a few days away from signing a million dollar record contract with a major label. I just thought that if I went to bed every night, I'd wake up the next day and kind of get a redo. He'd be back again. And in fact, it was weeks and weeks after he died that I had the same recurring nightmare I would walk into this bar, very identifiable, although not recognizable in the actual place that I'd ever been before. And he was sitting at a table and I would walk over to him and I'd throw my arms around him and embrace. And the second I'd close around his back, he would just fall limp, dead in my arms. And this just repeated itself every night over and over and over again. For those attempting to help the grieving, a loving and attending presence is often the best comfort. When we first face loss, we are not ready to hear about others' grief experiences or to be told to move on with our lives. Instead, we often need the listening ear of a compassionate friend who will give us permission to openly and honestly express the pain we feel. I think every grieving person has to come to, to grips with their own grief in their own way. Uh, any statement from anybody else that implies how they should feel or what they should be feeling is not likely to be helpful. It bothers me uh, how unloving and really arrogant it can be when Christians try to just uh, easily explain away someone's grief or give some sort of a godly cliché or some kind word that should just magically make them feel better. When really what needs to happen is for them to join in with the person in their grief and just uh, throw their arms in the air and say, I, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't understand. Uh, I just know that you need me right now to be with you in this place. For many of us, denial is replaced by anger as we search for someone to blame for our loss. We question the fairness of life in allowing ourselves or someone we love to suffer. 
Anger is a natural response to the feelings of abandonment and powerlessness that may accompany a significant loss. I don't think I wrestled with um, some of the temptations that others have in the face of loss, and that is to see God as the cause of their suffering. And it was clear to me that a human being was the cause of my mother's death, and I, I didn't, I wasn't tempted to, uh, to blaspheme God by blaming Him for evil. Um, instead, my question was, why didn't you stop it? Why did you allow it? And so it wasn't, why did you cause her? It was, were you powerless to intervene, or did you not care? Through it all, Jamie was exhibiting such strength and, and such endurance herself that it was very difficult for us to get too upset about it. Uh, her brother actually said that uh, he had wanted to be bitter and angry about it, but he couldn't because she wouldn't let him. So, uh, you know, through it all, it was just a, a, a real joy to us to watch her, uh, not because of the disease, but because of how she was responding to it. Lewis acknowledged, even in his anger and brokenness, that human beings are not promised a life free from suffering. But while we may acknowledge every life meets loss, it is difficult to have grief move from an abstract concept to a harsh reality. Lewis said that a person never truly knows the extent of his or her belief until the matter becomes an issue of life and death. The reality of death strips away all defenses. My mother's murder forced me to confront what I really believed and uh, what was really true. And one of the things that was true was that evil existed. And not just that it existed, but that I couldn't control it. And that forced me to ask a question of God. Where was he? Why didn't he intervene? It forced me to reckon with the fact that God allows evil to happen. Lewis said, you never really know how much you believe something until it's tested. And I, I realized for me that test with, with her death and the time of feeling it, I, I got to the point where I, I realized I really wasn't blaming God for it. And that was just such a wonderful feeling that I, that I, I was tested. And yet in the long run, I said, no, God, I still believe in you. I know that you're good and this is gonna work out. Our beliefs are always challenged when they encounter the world, and matters of life and death are the most extreme examples of that. Uh, I believe, as Lewis seemed to, that uh, these matters uh, ultimately challenge our beliefs to, to their very core. Uh, you no longer are able to hide behind your illusions. You're no longer able to rationalize. You have to deal with the issues that are there and dealing with them will either drive you to despair or it'll drive you to dependence on God. At one point in Grief Observed, he says that uh, you no, don't really test your faith until it's you're in a situation where you really see what the stakes are. And if you have a piece of rope that you're using to wrap a box, you're not too worried about how strong it is. But if you're hanging over a cliff from that rope, you're very concerned about how strong it is. That same image of how strong is the rope when you actually need it to support you Lewis follows very quickly talking about Jesus in Gethsemane, and both in Grief Observed and his letters, he said he's so glad that God didn't come to earth as a superman, as a man with nerves of steel, that you can see Christ's vulnerability before the tomb of Lazarus, and you can especially see it in Gethsemane. And he says that he would feel much more rage toward God if he knew that God hadn't suffered everything that we have suffered. 1992 was a pretty remarkable year. I had graduated from seminary and been ordained a United Methodist minister, and I had gone out to Denver where I was going to do graduate studies. And during seminary, I hadn't um, kept up with my training, but I was committed to getting back in shape and to get back to where I could run triathlons again. So it was a beautiful November evening. I went out for a quick ride after classes and as I got out to the turnaround, I um, noticed it was getting dark and I told myself, be careful, slow down, take it easy. 
and with a couple hundred yards of there, I had hit another cyclist and then I came to on the bike path and realized that something was very wrong. I could um, feel my legs, but my legs couldn't feel my hands when I touched them. So as I'm laying there, I had no idea what uh, was in my future. I had a really, um, well, I'd been a chaplain at a children's hospital for three years. I had some sense of what was happening with me, but I didn't know the full extent of it. And I had this um, notion that I would go and they would put me in a wheelchair and I would go home fairly soon. I had no idea all of the ramifications that paralysis meant in terms of all the different body systems and um, how my life would be affected on many, many levels. So after the accident, I was in University Hospital for acute care where they had to um, put two rods in my back and stabilize my condition, had to recover from the surgery. And then after a month's time, they transferred me over to one of the best rehab um, hospitals in the country that's in Denver at Craig Hospital. And there I was in for another three months where I had to learn um, how I was going to cope with life and learn how to use a wheelchair, how to manage my bladder and my bowels and my skin and care and learn how to move and um, balance myself. And so it was a, a remarkable period of time to completely relearn how to, um, to function again. For people of faith, doubt mixes with anger. Lewis recalled those times of hope when joy went into remission, only to relapse into a state of torment and frustration later as the cancer returned. He described the sense of being forsaken and unloved by God at a time when his comfort and presence was most needed. Meanwhile, where is God, he asked. When you are happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing him, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face, and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. I was walking with a friend and discussing this very issue of God's silence. Um, I really felt like I wasn't hearing God answer my prayers. He had often answered the prayers, my other prayers in my life at other times. And now, um, when I wanted him to answer this one, it seemed like he wasn't answering. He wasn't there. Uh, no one home. In some ways, I think I was prepared for this moment in that I had experienced loss in my life. Previously, my father died when I was 16, and I had worked as a chaplain at a children's hospital for three years. And so I had wrestled with some really hard questions about God. But still, I could really resonate with what Lewis said about the door being bolted shut and having access to God. The way I thought about it was um, that God was indifferent in some moments, it felt like. And also, I think more than anything, was um, a sense of being disconnected from God. It is common as we grieve to search for answers for why suffering happens. The most famous example of this search for truth is that undertaken by the biblical prophet Job, who experienced multiple losses, including the death of his children, the destruction of his possessions, and his own poor health. As he mourns, he seeks answers to the question of, why me? Job discusses his grief with three friends who each conclude that God punishes sin and that Job must have done something to deserve his fate. Finally, God appears, and in his discourse with Job, reveals that a human's limited understanding does not allow him to see the reasons for suffering. It's inevitable when you read Grief Observed to think of the book of Job and someone who's crying out in his misery to God for relief. Uh, he doesn't mention Job in Grief Observed. He does in his letters. Actually, he and Joy were talking just a few nights before her death. And he was trying to take a rather stoical Christian spiritual approach to her, her impending demise. 
And she kind of, she did this with him frequently. She challenged him and said, you're angry, go ahead and let that rage come out. And she's the one who brought up the book of Job. And she said, remember, uh, people talk about the patience of Job, but what we notice in the book is the impatience of Job. But remember that God was more pleased with the impatience of Job, who was asking honest questions, than with Job's comforters, who were offering rather glib rationalizations. So Joy actually gave uh, Lewis permission to be angry with God about this situation. And he felt that if she thought it was all right to rage a little bit against God and express your anger, that God would certainly accept that and understand that. Lewis described a similar encounter in his search for answers, stating that he felt as though God waved his questions away, not in a refusal to answer, but in a way that indicated the answer could not be understood. It is perhaps what the Apostle Paul referred to when he wrote, For now we see through a glass darkly. I think loss raises for us questions that are bigger than we are and we are meaning makers, and we try and figure it out. I can remember after her death, I began to really research the subject of heaven. Uh, people gave me books, of course, to read and read them all, and spent probably a good two, three years really studying the subject until finally, one day I realized I am not going to figure all this out. And, and it was good because I really believe there's a mystery there because there's some surprises in store. In our grief, we may begin to make promises or attempts to bargain with others or God to change our situation. Part of successful navigation through this season of grief is the eventual recognition that loss is inevitable and that no amount of pleading or bargaining will change the situation. I really didn't make bargains with God, but the thought came into uh, my head as I was dealing with Jamie's illness that um, I would gladly have taken her place uh, rather than her suffer these things. Guilt is another emotion many of us feel as we work through the grieving process. We regret things we have done or things we have failed to do, and we may feel that our actions have caused the loss itself. Sometimes we feel guilt at not being able to remember the way things were before the loss, at not being able to easily recall the face or the voice of a loved one who died, or not being able to remember the happy memories that existed before a separation or divorce, or the loss of a physical ability. For Lewis, guilt accompanied the difficulty in recalling the past as the snowflakes of his own being, as he called them, settled down on the top of the images of joy, changing his memories of her. Lewis had said that he didn't want uh, people to talk about his wife, but I felt that uh, if, when people shared their thoughts about Jamie, that it helped me in my grieving process, and I felt it honored her life. I remembered for several years very specific memories of Tracy, and I could go through A to Z in my mind. But after time, they, they, they all kind of fell away, and it's, it's now pretty much one really good memory of her that has stayed with me. Sometimes we experience guilt for feeling better with the passage of time, as Lewis continued on his path of self-recovery, he began to experience guilt in allowing himself to heal and return to his normal life. He felt that there was a sense of shame in recovery and that he was obligated to both continue and relish his grief. One of the first times um, that I, I felt like I was coming out of grief, I had was with a group of friends and um, we were just talking and I was really enjoying myself for the first time. And all of a sudden it was just like, oh, I wasn't thinking of Jamie. And it just, you know, for a moment I realized I had this happiness, but then immediately, almost immediately, I felt guilt because it was like, well, it was too soon. I shouldn't be feeling this. But yet this was exactly what Jamie wanted. She wanted us to be strong and she wanted us to keep the faith. And I felt then that at this point that I was honoring her 
by moving on and having and being able to enjoy my life again, even with her not present. You can get over the hurt and the baggage that comes with grief and loss, but you never get over missing the person. That'll stay, and it should. For some people, grief leads into a dark valley of depression, which encompasses a wide range of physical and emotional reactions. At this point or any point in the grief process, we may experience difficulty sleeping or eating. We may feel tired and confused or unable to concentrate on simple tasks. We experience a tremendous flood of emotions associated with the depression of loss, including sadness, loneliness, fear, and despair. Sometimes we express these feelings outwardly through tears and visible laments. I don't recall feeling self-pity as such. There was agony involved, though. Many times uh, at the beginning, I cried myself to sleep at night and until I finally was able to, to give her up to God and to trust Him and to just pray that I would be able to, to uh, be strong, to uh, help her not to be afraid. And that was the prayer, I think, that God answered. This was a seismic shift in my family. I knew we'd never be the same, and I knew I would never be the same. And that's actually part of where the fear came in. I became fearful that of the life of having nothing but sorrow. I couldn't see how life could ever be the same again. I knew the past was irretrievable. And all I could see stretching before me was sorrow. Some wage a more private battle, as was the case with Lewis. He acknowledged the invisible blanket that came between himself and the world around him, and the smothering feeling that overtook him as Lewis's initial anger gave way to apathy. So Lewis talks about feeling like there's a blanket between him and life, and that that resonated with me, and that I remember um, feeling numb and feeling someone in a fog and um, trying to find distance, so finding ways to distract myself from the pain or to find some way to um, avoid it and uh, wanting to be away from it. You know, after the funeral, after the, all the sympathy cards stopped and I had written all the thank yous and my life returned to normal, you know, I was back to work, going to church, eating, sleeping. Everything seemed meaningless. It, everything was put through the lens of my mother was murdered. And nothing seemed to matter. Um, I couldn't even taste my food. There is also, as Lewis describes, a laziness that accompanies grief in which we can no longer take pleasure in those things we enjoyed before the loss. For me, the self-pity, I, I began to see the signs of it was, I, I just wasn't enjoying things anymore. Sunny days, family, TV, movies, uh, hikes, it just was a real sense of loss and that was leading to depression, which isn't good, not the way to go. After Tim had died, a couple months later, uh, Kim Deal of the Breeders very kindly offered me the position of drummer in the band to go to New York and record an album. So I agreed and, and uh, gave it my best shot, but the timing just wasn't right. I wasn't right, my heart wasn't in it. I was just becoming lazier and lazier, and more apathetic. I eventually bowed out of the recording process and came back home to Dayton, where I just kind of went into a slump uh, sleeping for days and in about 12 to 18 months time after Tim's death I'd already put on over 100 pounds. I wouldn't call any of my reaction laziness but there was a numbness that was there. Uh, it was very difficult to get things started, my priorities changed. It took a lot of energy just to, to do ordinary things. 
Lewis believed that God would not help a person through grief until that person was ready. He likened this to a drowning person that cannot be given help until he or she tires and is able to accept help without resistance. I was a youth pastor at that time, and the biggest struggle for me was because of the position, I felt I had to act all in control and still be the leader, which meant I couldn't feel anything, and it, it wasn't real, and it's kind of like holding everything in, the pressure. Eventually, it's, it's going to get you in trouble. After a couple of years of uh, mourning and grieving and a lot of sleeping, my father actually just put an ultimatum forth and said, look, something has to change. You have to do something. I'm willing to put you through trade school. I'll buy you your first computer uh, if you'll just go and you'll do this. So I reluctantly agreed, uh, went, uh, instantly picked up on it, excelled, uh, graduated with honors, instantly got a job, and I've uh, hated computers ever since. It is important to recognize when the symptoms of grief move beyond the normal range of emotions associated with loss. When a person feels that life is no longer worth living or cannot perform the daily functions of life for an extended period of time, it is time to seek professional guidance in working through grief. The, the counselor that uh, I met with, and I do highly recommend grief counseling, uh, he helped me so much one day when he finally, he just looked at me and, and he said, are you going to fight? And it hit me and I knew what he said was true. You can't just go into self-pity because eventually it, it will destroy your life. And, and that's not a way to honor the death of somebody you really cared for. We must also remember that there is not a chronological timeline for how we cope with loss. Lewis acknowledged that, in grief, nothing stays put. One keeps on emerging from a phase, but it always recurs. C.S. Lewis, he talked about the fear that's involved with loss. And for me, it was the, the initial shock fear, but then it was ongoing. And it was more of a post-traumatic stress type fear. I called it being haunted. It just kind of would stay around and then something would trigger it and you would really feel it. Certain events may trigger a recurrence of grief, such as the anniversary of when the loss occurred, the revisiting of familiar people or places, or the holiday season. These triggers, whether anticipated or unexpected, may rekindle unpleasant emotions that must be worked through once again. I always think of loss as, uh, as cyclical, and so things will come along and it reminds you of the loss, for example, becoming a dad. Now all of a sudden I'm reminded um, of things I never anticipated, but you know, the way I play with my daughter is different than the way I would have played with my daughter before the accident and the paralysis. And so there's always occasions that come knew that um, reveal to you different dimensions of the loss. The agonies for me were very much like uh, what Lewis experienced. Um, they were like ticking time bombs. Uh, the memories would occur at any time, but I learned to um, see the beauty in those memories rather than the agony. I don't think I've ever entirely gotten over the loss of Tim. Um, little things remind me of him almost on a daily basis, especially musically. I hear uh, songs, bands, some bands that actually come out and, and list Brainiac as an influence in their music. And that, that always gives me great satisfaction that he lives on in that sense. But it also, you know, reminds me a little bit of my pain, uh, kind of like a little uh, picking away to scab from time to time. And uh, as far as Brainiac is concerned, there's always that that wonder, that what if, what would have happened. So in that sense, that loss uh, remains to this day. For many of us, the final leg in our journey with grief and loss brings acceptance, and with it, hope. It is here that we come to terms with our loss and find peace.
So at the time of my accident, I know some of my friends were really anxious that I would withdraw from life and I'd be a little bit more reserved in who I was. And I was a person who lived life pretty fully before the accident. And I would say I'm still that person now. I live life really fully. I have a great family. I'm a new dad. Um, I'm still an athlete. I hand cycle. I have a career and a ministry that's vital and meaningful, making a difference in my community. Um, before the accident, I never camped uh, on a mountain. But since the accident, um, we camped up at 11,000 feet. So um, I'm still living a full life um, as much as I can. I know for me, the day my son was born and uh, holding him in my arms, that was a real grace moment for me and uh, the light began to shine again. That was the wake up for me and life uh, was good. I don't have a moment when my grief subsided. It was really gradual for me, but I, I can remember they're just over time becoming um, able to laugh, able to notice beauty again, um, able to make plans again, and um, it was very subtle. And I really attribute it to the constancy of my husband and my friends who walked with me over time. It was a gradual process. The point at which we reach acceptance of our loss is also a time when we may begin to chart a new direction for our life, sometimes making drastic changes due to the lessons or realizations we've experienced in the grieving process. For me, I really learned what it was to be a Christian, what grace was all about, because I'd come to the end of myself, and I know as a fact, I'd, I stopped trying to make anything happen. And that's when I realized things started to happen. He started to move and uh, met Reggie and it wasn't long. We had a child and we named him Ian, which means gift, uh, grace. And, and things were, were, were rebirth, uh, fresh for us in my life. And I wasn't working for it. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to sabotage stuff as well. And yet he came through. That's why I know there's a God. To be able to go through something like that and yet end up on the, the other side saying, no, you can go forward, the restoration. Could have never done it myself. So if somebody was to say, you know, how could you still believe? How could I not? Is my point. How could I not? Because there's, I had to completely just let go and abandon myself and just say, I cannot make it through this. You're going to have to step in here. And lo and behold, he did. <laughs> he did. Absolutely. I know um, when Reggie came into my life, it was very much a surprise. But I can see the hand of God in it because she put up with me during, you know, those times of doubting and sadness and yet she was right there and was able to go through it with me. I don't think I could have done it alone. Matter of fact, I know I couldn't have done it. And I really thank God for her and what she means to me. Jamie's illness and death certainly changed my life in some ways. Uh, beyond a doubt, my priorities in life have changed. She taught me and uh, God taught me through this experience to start living life a day at a time, uh, looking at things as they are rather than as I wanted them to be. I think it also taught me that the real meaning of these events in life is not in the event, it's in the way that uh, you respond to those events. And uh, I think that's a lesson I'll never forget. Promises and hope are things that I cling to. I don't really understand the reasons why things happen the way they do, but because Jamie had a faith in God and the hopes and the promises of God that she believed in, I can do no less than to have the same hope and faith that she did. Even though I've never completely gotten over that loss, uh, my life has turned for the better. I've graduated from trade school, married. I have a beautiful eight-year-old boy named Noah. I'm uh, 
back in relationship with my creator. I'm active in my church, where I'm also playing drums now. Ironically, the colleague's comment that was so ridiculous at the time turned out to be true. Uh, I do think I'm a better therapist. <laughs> um, having been through this loss, I, I do have an empathy for folks who are grieving and can journey with them in that. But I still say to this day, I'd rather be a worse therapist than have had my mother these last 24 years. As we slowly come to terms with our grief, we accept that we may never find the answer for why the loss occurred. We cannot understand, Lewis wrote. The best is perhaps what we understand least. Uh, when Lewis says that the best is perhaps what we understand the least, uh, to me it that is the hope of the eternal unknown. As Francis Schaeffer wrote in one of his books, uh, we can have with the Word of God, true and unified knowledge, but we can't have exhaustive knowledge, uh, the exhaustive knowledge that only God has. And I think there's sort of a relief there, a hope that there are answers, there is understanding, just nothing that our, uh, our finite human minds can handle at this point in time. Part of life is discovering the, what the richness and the meaning of life. And um, the places where it's the deepest is the places that we discover new and in ways we never anticipate. And I imagine that that's the mystery of who God is and the mystery of love and the mystery of how we experience love with, you know, our loved ones and our neighbors and our world and creation. As for Lewis, he survived his wife Joy by three years before succumbing to renal failure just shy of his 65th birthday. There's a passage in Grief Observed where he says, As I rediscover my faith, I hope it's not another house of cards that will collapse when I face my own mortality. And I'm happy to say that his faith did not at all collapse as he faced his own mortality. He said, I feel like a seed that's been planted and I'm just waiting for the gardener to come along and allow me to sprout and come into my, my true and new life. His existence before joy, that of an intellectual scholar and writer, made Lewis a beloved person of the Christian faith. But it was his unexpected encounter with love and loss that made him a fully alive participant in the human experience. His grief observed became a new window to the world by which we can see the hope and promise of life after loss. I have nothing left in me but a bleeding heart that needs your truth. Yeah, I have nothing left in me but a bleeding heart that needs your truth. Search my heart, oh God, 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 search my heart, oh God. something you make art of ugly things you take my life and you make it sing yeah, yeah. you make it sing yeah. you make it sing praise praise God praise God Oh, praise Him, it yeah, prays. Praise God, 
praise God. Oh, praise Him. Praise. You call my praise God. 